If the notion of sin and its power to sever your connection with God is irrelevant to you, go ahead and skip the next lesson. You're not going to care about this study. But for those of you who yearn to grasp what sin is all about from a biblical perspective and comprehend its impact on you and prevent it from distancing you from your creator. Yeah, you're going to want to tune in to this. So all about sin. This lesson will answer the following questions. What how is sin defined in its original language and its and in scripture? What is Torah and what is its role regarding sin? How is sin equal to not having the law? What are the New Testament authors really referencing when they mention the law? And how does that deal with sin? What is the one goal that Yahweh has sought for mankind since the beginning, the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden? Let's start with the basics. What is sin? From a Hebrew perspective, from the Hebrew language, the original language written in scripture, what does it mean? Then we'll jump to the Greek. First in Hebrew, it's kata. It's a very meaning kata, meaning to sin or to miss the mark or the goal. In Judges, we see this word pop up so you can understand how it's used in Judges 2016. Among all this, these soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and what? Not miss, or in other words, not sin. See, normally we uh, connect the idea of sin with being something bad and evil, and rightfully so. We'll get into that. But sin at this most basic level literally means to miss some mark, as in the case here. Also in Proverbs 19.2 says, Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? So missing some kind of mark or goal, or in this case, the way, is the idea rooted in sin, the word that is pronounced kata. Now, I don't speak Hebrew, um, so... Hopefully I'm getting close enough with the phonetics. In Greece, in Greek, is harmatia. Harmatia, you'll see, have the same essence, meaning to be without a share in, to miss the mark, to err, to be mistaken, to miss or wander from a path of righteousness and honor, to do or go wrong, to wander from the law of God, violate God's law or sin. Some example you can see is in Romans 6, 1, where it's used. What shall we say then? Shall we go on Hamartia, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And Paul goes on. But again, we see this same essence is kept from Hebrew to Greek. Sometimes it's tough and sometimes much is lost in translation. But here we still see that same essence to miss some kind of mark or goal that we're after. So the question you're tuning in to answer here is how do we keep from missing the mark or the goal. What is this all about? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to go a little bit deeper into the Hebrew when it comes to the word Torah or Torah. So you may have heard this word in Hebrew circles and whatnot, but the word when you define it literally means law, direction, or instruction. The word is pronounced Torah. So example is Proverbs 28, 9. If anyone turns a deaf ear to my Torah, which is my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. Now, it's important that we define this word because oftentimes how we view this, most, most of us who are viewing this are likely American. We think of law in a different sense than instruction, which instruction is likely the more accurate definition for how to define Torah is instructions, steps that are guiding us in toward that mark, which we'll look at here in a second. Psalms one. Verse two says, but his delight is in Torah, the law of Yahweh. And in his Torah, the law, he meditates day and night. So what is the root word for Torah? Now you see here at the top, it says from 3384, which means it's coming from this root word. And we need to understand this root word before we can get an understanding of how does this play any role in sin and the mark that we're talking about? So let's go to the root word of Torah, which we'll see is Yara, the definition meaning to throw or shoot, cast or pour. Now, if we would have just looked at the word law, we would have never gotten any of this. And if we would have stopped at Torah instruction, we may not have thought this either. But in the Hebrew language, it's very concrete 
and is based in a lot of action words and verbs. So in the root of Torah, we hear to shoot or to throw or to cast this idea of uh, pointing someone or shooting in some direction, which makes sense when we start to think about the archery terms that were being used. This word is used in 1 Samuel 20, 20, where it says, I will shoot three arrows to the side of it as though I was shooting at a target. Yara, literally meaning to shoot something. So summarizing so far, we got sin meaning to miss the mark, just like in archery, like someone's thrown out a target, but they missed. And then we have Yara, shooting or throwing, releasing it as in releasing an arrow. But what is the relationship? between sin and Torah. Torah, in conclusion of this question is, intended to shoot or point us to the desired mark or goal. That's what it's all about. Torah, the instruction is intended to shoot or point us. It's, it's as if it's pointing saying, go this way to this mark. If we were to put it in the picture, it would look something like this. Where would the mark be? Well, let's say that the mark is here and the bullseye right at the center. If this is the bullseye, where is sin? Sin is going to be any of the marks, any of the points outside of that desired goal or mark. So in that ca this case, this arrow outside of that bullseye would be sin or any other mark outside of that. Now, the other question is, where is Torah? Where would I find that in this illustration? What would illustrate that? Now, keep in mind, these are just illustrations and not realistic uh, um, analogies to compare it to. But if we were to put one, Torah would be the person here trying to instruct or guide the arrow to hit the mark. That's what Torah does. It's an instruction pointing anyone to how to hit the mark. Now, even pulling away from the biblical and spiritual language of it, just looking at it from a a physical standpoint of archery is really simple. You have a mark, you have an arrow attempting to shoot that mark, and you have some guidance on when, where is that mark and how do I hit it? That's Torah. That's instruction or what's often translated as the law in our scriptures. This is why Paul talks about Torah points to the truth. In, in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law, the Torah, sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would have not known sin except through the law. Think about that. You wouldn't have known what sin was except through Torah. Just like we talked about in that picture, it's instructing us that there is the mark. It's saying, here's the mark and here's how you hit it. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law has said, you shall not covet. In Psalms 119, 142 Using Torah as well, we see your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Your law, Torah, is truth. Now, this is a huge claim. Your law, your Torah, your instruction is truth. Why is this important? Because in the world we live in today, everyone is looking for truth. Or should I say everyone is creating their own ideas of truth? And the question at the underneath it all oftentimes begs, where is your standard for truth? How are you coming up with that claim? Well, one of the places, the, the place that we can go to for truth is the word of God. Now, I will point out that it's not just for the believers. It is the truth. It is not a truth. It's the truth for all. And this is where it gets upsetting, because since relativity, we want to believe that things are relatively true. The, according to you and according from me, it's so much so to the point where we're able to redefine what's true and truth and become our own ruler in a sense, both one that measures and one that rules. We want to become our own ruler who creates truth. But the truth is found in his instruction, in his Torah. That is the place we should start. It helps us to understand what sin is, which meaning where someone missed the mark and when someone hits the mark, but it also instructs us on how to hit that mark. Romans 3 says the same thing in verse 20. Paul says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law, by the Torah, 
is the knowledge of sin. It can only be established by his instruction. That's what tells us what sin is and how we get to it and keep away from it. Matter of fact, transgressors, those who break the law or don't hit the mark, can be defined based on Torah. In James 2, 8, it says, If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by what? By the law, by the Torah, as transgressors. Now, that sounds like some judging words, doesn't it? Why? Because it is. The word of God, the truth, the Torah is judging, saying you missed it. And these are some three letter words that no one, very few people want to hear is sin. We want to hear that we made a mistake. We want to hear about um, you have different perspective than I do. But to say that someone sinned is a huge accusation. And we start pulling the word in the car of judgment out. But that's what the word of God does. It instructs us on how to correctly judge. And Yeshua teaches us that when he talks about um, examining the plank in your own eye instead of the splinter in someone else, he says, judge properly, meaning use the word of God properly on how to judge. Take care of yourself, then others, then help your brother. But it's with this instruction. But the word does indeed judge, in this case, as transgressors. To sin is the state without Torah. So what is sin? It is literally in a state, living in a state without the instruction, without his law. First John 3, 4 says it clearly. Whoever commits sin, harmatia, also commits lawlessness, anamia, and sin is lawlessness. So what is anamia? This is a new word that we've just encountered. In Greek, anemia, it's actually a combination of two words. Let's look at it. So, anemia comes from the 459, which we'll look at here in a second. But by definition, just like we just like we saw in English, it's defined in Greek as to be a condition without law, lawlessness. And as we already defined, law was pointing to his Torah, his instruction. This is a condition without law. One, because of being ignorant. I did not know. I had no clue. And two, because of violating it. So any of those conditions are without the law. This is a state of sin. This means we're missing the mark because we're not uh, walking in the instruction that was given because of ignorance or because of violation, even though we knew about it. Contempt and violation of law, iniquity and wickedness. Now, I mentioned a second ago, it came from 459 as a root. So what is what is that word? This word is anamos, a combination of two words, as I mentioned earlier, a and namos. Namos meaning law and a or a meaning the negative, just like we would have in, in the beginning of many of our English words. So this negates the law. So without law. The definition is destitute of law in referring to the Mosaic law, departing from the law like a violator of the law, lawless and wicked. This A is the negative participle, which we just mentioned. And the namos means anything established, anything received, usage, a custom, a law, a command. So namos is the law, the instruction part. A is without. So that's animos. Now, when we see this in scripture, we translate it is going to be translated pointing back to the Mosaic law system, to Torah, to the law of God most of the time. So it's important to note that because in many circles, in many religious Christian circles, the word law is is divorced from the Old Testament and the commands and his instructions is separated. But these New Testament authors, including Yeshua himself, are often referring, and most of the time, I almost want to say every time, referring back to the Mosaic law or to the law that God has established in what we call the Old Testament. Example of, of nomos is in Romans 2.12, where it says, For as many as have sinned without law, meaning anomos, will also perish without law. And as many have sinned in the law, will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just, are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law of the namos would be just what are they talking about the law of god the instruction of yahweh 
Well, there can only be one. The instruction that was established since the beginning. The Ten Commandments and the laws that we see in what we call the Old Testament. This, the, Paul is saying here that the one who does these are justified. Now, this is a whole other lesson to go into. Not that a person can uh, do acts of works to receive this, but they must be walking in righteousness. You cannot live in sin, even just looking at the Ten Commandments, living as a murderer and still think you're going to have salvation. But the point here is that the Torah is an instruction, is the namos. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law. This is in the words of Yeshua, the namos. I did not come to abolish that. This has already been established. Or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. Plureyu is a whole other study on how he, what it means to fulfill, which means he was doing them. He did not come to get rid of them. This is what's used to determine what is sin and how we can follow it. So if you're concerned about being separated from God because of sin, we must understand that the nature of sin is to be outside of his Torah. If there is instruction that he's literally telling you on your spirit and some things you read or heard from Scripture, and it's very clear, that's the one place to start and making sure we're not living in that sin. Sin is lawlessness, as we mentioned. Here's another description in Matthew 24 that highlights this. Then Yeshua is speaking about a day to come as a prophecy. Then they will deliver you up to the tribul to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness, anomia, will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Wow. Because of lawlessness. Let's go back to that definition. Lawlessness is to be in a state that is not recognizing, observing and violating the Torah and the instruction that God has laid out in his scripture and all of scripture. And, and the false prophets are rising up, deceiving those as if this is not wrong, deceiving people. And because of this lawlessness, many will turn and the love of many are going cold. Even in this day, there are many who are teaching that his instruction is not to be listened to. Many are teaching that we can have it any way we want to and come up with anything we, we want to do. Just do this. Just be kind. Just do this. But we're not heeding his instruction and his law clearly. Remember that Yeshua is to be your master, no one else. And we need to listen to his words. If I were to put a picture to it, this is what it might look like. Someone trying to hit the target without Torah. Anam animos, anamia, without Torah. A, a state without instruction. Just coming up with their own ways. And this is so much the state today than probably ever, any time before. Where people are literally making up their own idea for truth. And saying, this is what I'm going to aim for. This is how it's going to be. And this is what I decide. And no one can tell them otherwise. Which is fine. But for those of us who are ascribing to follow Yeshua and understand that there is a kingdom to come and there is a kingdom that has already come. He's already have established rules, instructions and laws. And there is a truth and there is something that is wrong. And he judges all according to that truth. We cannot do that. Matter of fact, this is more like a person being guided by the adversary because surely they're not running their own show. Oftentimes they're being conjoled and uh, encouraged by the adversary, Hasatan or Satan, and, and, and are being told to shoot for a different target. No, don't shoot that one. Shoot this one. This is the goal. You want to be beautiful. You want to be intelligent. You want to be rich. You want to be powerful. This is the point of life. And whatever the goal is and saying that this is where you should put all your eggs and all your energy and all your focus. And then we hit that mark, not realizing that we miss. I reminded of a scripture in Revelation that says you they were pitiful, poor, blind and naked. He says, pity you guys. I think it was the rich. You were, but then realize that they were pitiful, poor, blind and naked, completely hitting a target and failing, aiming for a target that they didn't realize they were failing at each time. This is what the adversary does. This is the state of anomia, of torlessness, of no instruction, no guidance and an unwillingness 
to humble oneself, to listen to anyone other than themselves or some other uh, teaching or leader that does not ascribe and align with the teachings of Yahweh. Now, something else becomes sin. Matter of fact, anything outside of that original point that we mentioned was Torah will be sin. First John 3, 4 makes it clear now. Rereading it, we may see it in a different lens. Whoever commits sin also commits onomia. And sin is, is equal to lawlessness. What is sin? It's the state of living without Torah, without his instruction. Not without our own, not without the Constitution. Doesn't have anything to do with America and its laws, which I believed at one time when I was reading this. I was like, well, maybe I should follow the law. But that's not the law. We already have a constitution as believers. God already has laid a constitution throughout this universe. It's up to us as his subjects to submit to them and follow them. Matter of fact, a, uh, a commentary, Tim Hicks, says it this way. John makes it clear to us that sin, hamartia, is defined as lawlessness. This Greek word anomia is the word regularly used to translate the Hebrew word Torah in the Septuagint with a prefix alpha which is equivalent to our English prefix un in a word like unlawful, which we discussed earlier. Thus, anomia could just as accurately be translated into the English as literally no Torah in the sense of against Torah or negating Torah. The attempts of some to interpret anomia as in a general sense, unwillingness to submit to law, disregards the obvious use of the term throughout the Septuagint a use which must be taken into consideration when seeking to know how the word is used in the apostolic scriptures. So he's mentioning the apostolic scriptures because the apostles were using it this way. We cannot try to water it down and simply say um, it's a general sense. And no, he's spe specifically talking about his instruction, his Torah. And another commentary, um, John Scott says the statement sin is lawlessness. That is a defiant violation of God's moral law. So identifies the two as to render them interchangeable terms. Wherever one of them is read, it is possible to submit the other. It is not just that sin manifests itself in disregard to God's law, but that sin is in its very nature lawlessness. Lawlessness is the essence, not the result of sin. Torah is found in the Old Testament and New Testament. So if you want to understand sin, you have to understand his instruction and his instructions all throughout scripture. Sin is to function. Sin is functioning outside of the instruction of Yahweh's commands as they are found throughout all scripture. That's why in 2 Timothy, Paul writes all scripture, all scripture. What scripture was he referencing if it was not for what we consider the Old Testament? Because nothing was written at this time. There was no other scripture to point to. All scripture is God breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Why am I giving such a heavy emphasis on his Torah being present, even in what we consider the Old Testament? Why? Because there's a movement uh, of mainline Christianity that says we should ignore and dismiss it, or even water it down to say there's some good practicals there, but it's not the same way as the New Testament. But the whole New Testament is built on what the teachings from the Torah said in the old. And they're pointing to that. There is no division line that we think of. And that's why Yeshua even said, I did not come to abolish these law or the prophets. So the question now is, what is the goal or the mark? See, we talked about sin and missing the mark. We talked about Torah and how it instructs us to hit that mark. But what is this mark that we're trying to hit? How would you define it? You can put it in the comments or comment below before you get to the answer. But how would you define it? What is the mark? You can pause it and put it there. I was surprised because my answer was not the answer I discovered upon researching and looking deeper into this. My answer was obedience, was to be righteous, was to do what he says. That's what the mark. But actually, the mark goes a bit deeper. The mark is oneness in our relationship with Yahweh, in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. That's the mark. That's the goal. It's not ro uh, clinical and robotic about doing this or not doing that. It's really about intimacy, about building a relationship and restoring what was lost in the garden. You see, sin separates 
as we mentioned earlier in this scripture. Surely the arm of Yahweh is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Notice that separation is the key here. Sin is addressed because it is acting as a separating agent between us and God. That's why it becomes a, a big problem in a big part of our conversation, not because it's the thing to pursue or run from. It's the thing that's getting in the way of our relationship with God. It says your sins has hidden, have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. This is an absolute problem. We want to be heard. We want to be in relationship and intimacy again with our father. And sin is causing that problem. But the goal is oneness. The goal is a relationship. The goal is intimacy. Your dad, your father in heaven, intimately, intimately wants to know you again, wants to be in close relationship with you again. And that should be something that excites us. This is not just, again, a robotic uh, obeying of laws and scriptures and all these things. This is a love story where our God is wanting to reconcile with us. That's why James says in James 4, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. You hear the language again, draw near to him, not just obedience. Why? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. There we go. There's an intimacy. There's a relationship that's being rekindled. But the onus is on us first to draw near to him because he's done all the work. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Along that process, we should be uh, repenting, cleansing our hands and our minds of the sin that's kept us separated from God because the goal is to draw near to him. Matter of fact, the Levites were considered the ones near him, the, the near ones. On um, the altar, when they gave um, offerings, they would do burnt offerings. Why? It was a way of drawing near to God. The smoke he was smelling connect them. It was about closeness, not adherence to rules and instructions. Since the beginning, he initiated this plan because before the fall with Adam and Eve, there was that relationship and then it was lost. In Genesis 3.15, it says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, he's trying to reconcile. He's putting in the plan. Now, I know it sounds he's already had the plan and all these things. I'm trying to talk through it because God it shows here in this scripture that it was not OK that the serpent came in and deceived and caused a rift in their relationship. And he's making sure there's a plan initiated since the beginning. To reestablish connection from for man. Even though Adam and Eve had to be kicked out the garden, I'm sure that was extremely painful that they could not can not not so much for them as it was for him who knew them better than any. Just like a father to their children who can go off and not understand the love that that father has for them. But it was painful. and He's putting in place now means to reconcile. And finally, we hear second Corinthians five. Paul ex ex excitedly talks about how we now are being reconciled. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Yeshua, the Messiah, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, reconciling the world to himself, not in putting their transpasses to them and has committed to us the word word of reconciliation over and over from beginning to end. You're going to hear a father who's longing to reestablish a relationship with his children. I'm reminded of a scripture, I believe, in Isaiah says, all, all day long, I've held out my hand to an obstinate people. He's hurting, wanting to reconcile, wanting to reconvene, wanting to have the intimacy and the oneness that he's always had before. Paul talks about it here, about reconciling us through his son. That's what Genesis was referring to. And now we get to have that. That's the mark. And he mentions again, we can see the same language. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. 
and the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. He contrasts where we were before to where we are now. He didn't say we went from not obeying to obeying. He didn't say we went from living in sin to now we're walking in righteousness. No, that's not the point. The point is reconciliation. We're at one and at peace with God again. God has drawn us back through his son. And this is an exciting moment. Lastly, Yeshua, we see this in his prayer as he prays for his disciples and even us. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who would believe in me through the word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Listen to that, that they all may be one. And I in you, that they also may be one in us. You hear it so clearly now. The goal is oneness. Yeshua says to, to his father, you and I are one. And now the goal is for them to also be one, just like we are, that the world may believe that you sent me. He's calling back his children. He's calling us back in to a relationship and reconciling us in a way that only existed in the beginning before the fall. In summary, when we think about sin, sin means to miss the mark or the intended target or goal that we're aiming for. The mark is achieved is achieving oneness in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. It's not about duties and acts, which is so easy to get caught up in. Uh, again, I always mention prayers and church goings and dressing like this, do's this and don't do that. It's not about those things. While those things are necessary in, as you pursue a loving relationship with anyone, how much more, Yahweh? They're not the goal. The goal is intimacy, the oneness. Torah is our instructor in accomplishing this goal. If we are to accomplish this oneness, we must submit to the fact that our truth, our standard for truth on how we do that, defining what is sin and how do we avoid it and get to oneness, we have to submit to his instruction. What is he calling us to do so that we can be one? Not that it's just a list of rules. The absence of Torah is, this, is lawlessness. Sin is present whenever Torah is not. Sin is always present whenever his instruction is not, whether due to ignorance or just right out, outright violation of it. New Testament references to the law, Torah, also point back to Old Testament commandments. And we must remember that as we're reading through Scripture, not to limit ourselves and say, this is all I'm going to look at, but bag up and ask, what is my father? What is the creator of all this universe? wants from me in order to draw me back in to intimacy, intimate relationship. Hitting the mark or the goal is simply is not simply about avoiding sin and obeying commands. It's about doing whatever we need to do to restore the relationship originally intended since the beginning. Are you doing whatever you can do to restore a relationship with him? So when we think about sin, let this not be about a running away from sin or a decreasing how much sin the goal is intimacy in a relationship. What can I do to run into his arms? Because that's what he's waiting for. Reconciliation. Thank you for tuning in. I hope this has been a, a ministry to you. Please share, like, subscribe. If you feel like you know somebody who could use a reminder, some strengthening, or just to learn what sin is and what God expects through that.